is an announcement. We have two lovely, lovely broadsides over on that table uh, that are for sale. One from Linda Hogan and one from Gary Snyder. They're $35 a piece and they're going to um, be collector's items so they will be worth a fortune in the future. And they are also financing a special issue of Flyway that's going to come out of this symposium. I followed uh, Linda Hogan's work through the years and then for my book called The Healing Circle with Patricia Foster, we asked Linda Hogan to give us an essay about recovering from illness. She turned in a beautiful, beautiful essay about healing with the use of Native American medicine. When I read that piece, Linda Hogan became an inspiration to me. She was a woman who was writing from her own roots. She was a woman who had coped with severe challenges. She was a woman who brought a cosmic mystical vision to the page. Linda Hogan has done it all. She has written poetry, fiction, nonfiction, drama, and a documentary, Everything Has a Spirit, an American Indian Religious Freedom. Some of the books that come to mind are Dwelling, The Book of Medicine, Mean Spirit, and The Woman Who Watches Over the World. She has won every award in NEA, the Guggenheim, Atlanta Foundation Award, Lifetime Achievement Award for the Native Writers Circle of America. When an ordinary naturalist uh, like you or me looks at the world and maybe looks at a bat, we think, oh, isn't that interesting? And we maybe stay with it for five minutes. Linda Hogan looks at a bat and then she rummages through the garbage and finds an old hamburger container and takes the bat home and watches it for days and its mating rituals. I've never met a writer who had a keener eye or a better perception of the world and we're pleased to have her here with us tonight. Linda Hogan. a nice introduction, thank you. It was two bats mating. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking about the scene, um, wilderness, and um, what a difficult theme it is, and that just by the very fact of us being in wilderness, looking at it or talking about it, in a way it ceases to be wilderness. So um, what I'm thinking about is how we re, um, revivify the world and uh, look at the wilderness that's all around us. I mean, I, I know, like, well, I live in the country, and so I'm lucky in a way, and in other ways I'm not, because sometimes I'm out in the middle of the night chasing mountain lions away, and, you know, they, rep they definitely are wilderness, but if they don't go the way that I want them to go, they'll go into town where somebody will shoot them. So I, I remind them about the people with guns, and talk to them about it, and they usually go the other way, except I had one adolescent that was um, a little difficult to get along with, and I ended up having to spotlight him until I intimidated him back into a corner where he could eat somebody else's kids. But, so I, at least I didn't have to worry about him eating my dog, cat, horses, family, or whatever. I thought, well, he'll go that way. But um, one of the things that I, I think is that there's an intelligence that infuses all nature and that um, an ant hill, ants, um, I've, I've been studying ants for years and working on a long essay about ants and ceremonies about ants throughout the world. And I have an ant hill 
close to where I live that I study and actually have watched the ants put together structure inside. I don't know what it looks like inside because I don't want to take it apart, but they use certain pieces of wood and I've cut wood in those shapes and sizes and given it to them and they take the wood in and um, been interested to read that in Australia, Aboriginal people know when a fire is coming, when they're in the bush, because the ants use quartz and put on the side of the ant hills to reflect away the heat because they have to keep the temperature inside at 71 degrees at all times. So there's an intelligence that's always around us that we don't always see, that we don't always know and that when we pay attention to that intelligence, we can say that is wilderness, and that is, um, that is the wild, and it's a knowledge beyond our knowledge, and it's a knowledge probably beyond where we'll ever go. Like my cousin said one time, we are eating, and he said, you know, well, in a way we're eating the gods because Every one of the pieces of food that we're eating has a story or a myth or a creation tale told about it. And so in a way, we're always eating the gods and they're all around us. Um, but one of the things that I've also thought that happens when people are writing about wilderness and literature, I apologize for my voice. I'm recovering, but I've had pneumonia and I'm just, my voice is a little bit off. Usually I sound like um, Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that great person with a great voice? I don't know. But um, I was thinking that Normally we're talking about ourselves in the wild, like writers always talk about, I went here and I did this. And so that it's always really about that person. It's never really about the outside. It's never really about what's around them. And, and even when they go deeper and they reflect on it, it's still about that person. They're not separate from it. From it. So. I was thinking about how do we think about um, the world residing outside of us and how do we put ourselves in our small place so that the world can exist in its large place around us. And I have an essay I'm going to read called The Great Without. It's in a collection of anthologies called Face to Face that came out last August from, uh, uh, what's it called, FSG, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. <coughs> Women Writers on Faith, Mysticism, and Awakening. And this is true, actually, um, about European natural histories. In European natural histories, human imagination was most often projected onto the outside world. Pliny's natural history, for instance, was an errant map of a true world. There were dog-headed humans who could only bark, men with heads in their chests, and people with only one foot but with the ability to leap powerfully and to use the foot of, as a shade tree. There were mermaids, springs believed to grant eternal life, and islands where demons or angels lived. At one time, the Egyptians thought that people on the other side of the world walked upside down. Bestiaries included the phoenix, griffins, and unicorns. Unshaped by fact, knowledge, or even observation, these fantasy worlds became the world as seen by the human mind. Even in later times, the relationship between nature and humanity posed a dilemma. Once it was thought that the world entered the human eye and that only through our seeing it 
did it exist? There was much discussion about how a mountain could fit into the human eye. Can't you just see it now? There's a committee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this difficulty with perspective pushed humans toward other conclusions just as erroneous as believing foremost in the eye of the beholder. Euclid thought the eye was the point of origins for all things. Plato believed the world emanated from the eye, while others thought that there was something given off from objects by which we perceived them. In any case, most of the theories made nature smaller than it is and made the human larger. Vision was about the seer only and not the seen. Nothing could be more different from how tribal people on all continents have seen the world from the perspective of those who have remained in their own terrain for thousands of years, there were and are other points of view. For tribal thinkers, the outside world creates the human. We are alive to processes within and without the self. It is a more humble way to view the world and far more steady. Nature is the creator, not the created. Also, it watches us. That's another interesting thing that people don't think about, that the bees that live outside your house, they watch you. They know your habits. They know when you come and go. The wasps that live outside your house, they know your habits. All the animals do, um, the skunks, whatever. They know, they know when you come and go. Nothing could be more different from how tribal people, oh, wait a minute, I just read that. You want to hear it again? <laughs> there exists, too, a geography of spirit that is tied to and comes from the larger geography of nature. It offers to humans the bounty and richness of the world. Father Berard Hale, a priest traveling among the Navajo in the 1930s, was in awe of the complexity of their knowledge, one that exists within the context of what we now call an ecosystem. In the upward moving way, for example, the ceremony brings in all aspects of the growth of plants. The movement upward as the roots deepen, the insects beneath and above the ground, the species of birds that come to this plant. All aspects of the ceremony revealed a wide knowledge of the world. In order to heal, this outside life and world must be taken in and seen by the patient as being part of one working system. Lawrence Vanderpost, a writer, naturalist, and philosopher, psychologist who grew up in Africa, wrote in his essay, The Great Uprooter, about how his son's illness was announced by a dream. In the dream, the young man stood on a beach, unable to move, watching a great tidal wave of water bearing down on him. From out of the swell of the wave, a large black elephant walked toward him. It was this dream Vanderpost was certain that announced his son's cancer first point of cellular change. Vanderpost called the dream something that came from the great without. Such an experience seemed to encompass, he said, all the withouts and withins a human could experience. Nature is now too often defined by people who are fragmented from the land. Such a world is seldom one that carries and creates the human spirit. Too rarely is it understood that the soul lies at all points of intersection between human consciousness and the rest of nature. Skin is hardly a container. Our boundaries are not solid. We are permeable. And even when we are solitary dreamers, we are rooted in the soul outside. If we are open enough, strong enough to connect with the world, we become something greater than what we are. Turn of the century, Lakota writer Shikala Saw, Gertrude Simmons Bonin, 
grow to the separation between humankind and the natural world as a great loss for her. In her bio autobiography, she said that nature was what would have helped her to survive her forced removal to Indian boarding school. I was ready to curse men of small capacity for being the dwarfs their God had made them. In the process of my education, I had lost all consciousness of the nature, nature world about me. Thus, when a hidden rage took me to the small white-walled prison, which I then called my room, I unknowingly turned away from my own salvation. For the white man's papers, I had given up my faith in the Great Spirit. For those same papers, I had forgotten the healing in the trees and brooks. Like a slender tree, I had been uprooted from my mother, nature, and God. She might have agreed with Pliny that there were dog-headed barking men and men with heads, not hearts, in their chests. Soul loss is what happens as the world around us disappears. In contemporary North American Hispanic communities, soul loss is called susto. It is a common condition in the modern world. Susto probably began when the soul was banished from nature, when humanity withdrew from the world, when there became only two things, human and nature, animate and inanimate, sentient and not. This was when the soul first began to slip away and crumble. In the reversal and healing of soul loss, Brazilian tribal members who tragically lost their land and place in the world and now live in cities visit or reimagine nature in order to become well again. Anthropologist Michael Harner wrote about healing methods among Indian people relocated to an urban slum in Peru. The healing takes place in the forest at night as the person is returned for a while to the land he or she once knew. Such people are often cured through their renewed connections, their, quote, visions of the river forest world, including visions of animals, snakes, and plants. Unfortunately, these places are now only ghosts of what they once were. The cure for susto, soul sickness, is not in books. It is written in the bark of a tree, in the moonlit silence of night, in the bank of a river and the water's motion. The cure is outside ourselves. In the 1500s, Paracelsus, considered by many to be a father of modern medicine, was greatly disliked by his contemporaries. For a while, he, was almost returned, he almost returned the practice of medicine to its wider place of relationships by emphasizing the importance of harmony between man and nature. His view of healing was in keeping with the one that tribal elders still hold, that a human being is a small model of the world and the universe. Vast spaces stretch inside us, he thought, an inner firmament, large as the outer world. The world inside the mind is lovely sometimes and large. Its existence is why a person can recall the mist of morning clouds on a hill, the fern forest, and the black skies of night that the Lucino call their spirit acknowledging that the soul of the world is great within the human soul. It is an enlarged and generous sense of self, life, and being, as if not only the body is a creation of the world elements, but air and light and night sky have created an inner vision that some have called a map of the cosmos. In Lakota astronomy, the stars are called the breath of the Great Spirit. It is as if the old Lakota foresaw physics and modern astronomy, 
sciences that now tell us we are the transformed matter of stars, that the human body is a kind of cosmology. The inward may have been all along the wrong direction to seek. A person seems so little and small, and without is the river, the mountain, the forest of fern and tree, the desert with its, liz its lizards, the glacial meltings and freezings and movements of life. The cure for soul loss is in the mist of morning, the grass that grew a little through the night, the first warmth of sunlight, the waking human in a world infused with intelligence and spirit. One of the things about astronomy that I, astronomies I've learned since I wrote that essay, I've worked with a number of people from different tribes, <coughs> and one of the women did a planetarium. She's Navajo, and she does Navajo astronomy, and it's a traveling planetarium. She takes it from school to school, and she does the astronomy, and she shows all the different. Um, constellations, rattlesnake, um, bear, buffalo, um, let's see, weasel, completely different constellations than in European mythology. And I thought, well now, who is it that gave this um, planet or this, you know, planet the name Venus? You know, like, where did the word Venus come from? Or Mars? And um, so we've been trying to put together an astronomy from the four directions. So we're doing southeastern Eskimo and Navajo and then um, northeastern. And right now we have like a huge number of people working on this project. And it's very exciting. And it makes European astronomy seem, you know, really insignificant. So when I say that Loco Lakota foresaw I have to say that probably Lakota astronomy was way ahead. It didn't foresee, it was like ahead of uh, European astronomy. And in fact, um, it's been really interesting working with Navajos because it's the most complex language. Um, there are more verbs in Navajo than there are words in the entire English language. and each verb has um, numerous different meanings. So you don't have just, you know, go, went, you know, will be going. I mean, there are lots of different conjugations and different ways of looking at it. And I was all thrilled about that. And then this one Navajo guy said, and in addition to that, there's 12 dimensions to each one. And I said, wait, that, I can't go that far. <laughs> That's too hard. But um, one of the things that I find is that, you know, I mean, wilderness and everything is not seen and is shrunk because our minds are so shrunk because we don't even know those 12 dimensions. We just barely know one. And especially those of us who speak in only one language or even two. If you don't have Navajo, you're just not with it. <laughs> I was going to read a section from Sol a couple sections from Solar Storms just because we're talking about wilderness and solar storms, while it's about a lot of different things, um, including adoption and including um, the Hydro-Quebec um, development at James Bay. It's also about women who travel, who travel rivers and in a way are restored to their natural life because they're living in the wild. 
And so I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts from um, while they're traveling. Bush is the main, one of the main characters, and it's um, being narrated by someone who is like her grandchild. On our journey, Bush opened like the lilies that flowered on some of the islands, at first tentative and delicate, and finally with resolve. It was as if she had needed this place and all the water to sing in room to hold out her hands. Water and sky were windows she peered through to something beyond this world. Or perhaps they were mirrors in which she saw herself, her skin, her hands, her thighs, all brand new. She was as uncontained as she had previously been contained by skin, house, island, and water. Now it seemed there were no borders. In shadows and in deep woods she vanished, or she danced a slow dance, or she talked to the land. Some nights I sat beside the fire and saw her against the deepening sky, walking toward us, or sitting on a rock, or moving into the woods, stealthy as an animal. Time dropped away from her, her eyes softened. She might have been thinking of the things she had been dealt in her life, the betrayals, the unhealable wounds, the loss of me, the solitude she had needed and thrived on. At times, too, I thought I heard Agnes, her mother, singing, talking the old language inside a tent. As for me, I was awake in time that was measured from before axes, before traps, and carpenter's nails. It was this gap in time we entered, and it was a place between worlds. I was under the spell of wilderness, close to what no one had ever been able to call by name. Everything merged and united. There were no sharp distinctions left between darkness and light. Water and air became the same thing as did water and land in the marshy broth of creation. Inside the clear water we passed over, rocks looked only a few inches away. Birds swam across lakes. It was all one thing. The canoes were our bodies skin. We passed through green leaves, wild rice, and rushes. In small lakes, dense with lily pads, tiny frogs leapt from leaves into the water as we passed. I took that trip <clears throat> as research and came back looking like Popeye with these big muscles. But the really interesting things were these frogs because they were so fast. I never ever saw a frog. I just saw them jump and that was it. They were just gone. And that's always amazed me because, well, I love frogs and it was really kind of a shame that I missed all those frogs, but you know, they were really quick and they saw us coming. I think I'm gonna, um, okay, here we go. Dora Rouge is the old, old lady. Creation, according to Dora Rouge, was an ongoing thing. On the eighth day of creation, she doesn't believe in the Bible. They're rewriting the Bible, of course. On the eighth day of creation, Dora Rouge told me human beings were given their place with the earth. By then, some of the humans must have drifted away across the newly formed waters toward even newer land, she said. Or maybe they just had poor memories. 
but there must have been some reason those people thought there were only six day of creation and one of rest, that they thought it ended there. Then on the ninth day was the creation of stories, and these had many uses. They taught a thing or two about doing work, about kindness and love. She told me there were even stories to show a way out of unhappiness. Another day was devoted to snails and slugs, night crawlers and silverfish, roaches. Then there was the creation of singing and songs. If those drifting ones had stayed behind, they might have learned the antidote for war, she said, but they, only, they heard only as far as the creation of war on the sixth day. Thieves were created on that day, too. With tenderness, I looked at Dora Rouge, her white hair, her face with light coming from it. Never, I thought, that day was life so good, nor women more wonderful. At times, I saw something shining in the depths of bush, something I thought I could reach inside and touch, take out, turn over in my hand, and love. She was the closest thing I had to a mother. Dora Rouge, who insisted she was born, knew everything was born new every day, was the closest thing I had to God. And I was partly made in the old woman's image, right down to the owl beak nose and dark curved brows. And when she spoke the days of creation, I believed in them. That's what I love about fiction. You can make up new days of creation. <laughs> and antidotes to war. I think our leaders should take, take some fiction and do a little creation. And <laughs> Let's see, I'm gonna read a few poems and then I'll answer some questions. Can you hear me, understand me okay? I know my voice is really a wreck, but. I had a whole lot of quotes I wanted to read, but I think I'll read them later. Um, a couple of them are by Wilson Harris, who's, who has a really interesting book of essays on literature, and he talks about um, language and language in wilderness and language and um, the role of the artist in the world to return us to that. And that, uh, here's the line I really liked, which is, you know, what is language threaded into spa the space of time, which is prior to human discourse. And I, I was thinking when I read that quote, that in a way prior to human discourse is what we're thinking about when we're thinking about wilderness. Or I saw in the, in the, um, in the agenda that there was wilderness and wildness and what was the difference. And I was thinking, gee, I think one's a verb and one's a noun. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'll have to ask a Navajo about that. They're probably both verbs. <laughs> Map. This is a world so vast and lonely without end with mountains named for men who brought hunger from other lands and fear of the thick, dark forest of trees that held each other up, knowing fire dreamed of swallowing them and spoke an older tongue, and the tongue of the nation of wolves was the wind around them. Even ice was not silent. It cried its broken self back to warmth but they called it ice, wolf, forest of sticks, 
as if words would make it something they could hold in gloved hands, open, plot away, and follow. This is the map of the forsaken world. This is the world without end, where forests have been cut away from their trees. These are the lines Wolf could not pass over. This is what I know from science, that a grain of dust dwells at the center of every flake of snow, that ice can have its way with land, that wolves live inside a circle of their own beginning. This is what I know from blood. The first language is not our own. There are names each things have for themselves. And beneath us, the other order already moves. It is burning. It is dreaming. It is waking up. Well, since you're selling Carrie over there, I'll read this uh, poem, Carrie. It's about an osprey that caught a fish too big. And the fish pulled the osprey down underwater. And the osprey, uh, when it was caught, had the skeleton of the, I mean, the, with the fish, when it was caught, had the skeleton of the osprey still attached with its talons in the um, fish. Carrie, from water's broken mirror, we pulled it alive and shining, gasping the painful other element of air. It was not just fish, there was more. It was hawk, once wild with hunger. Sharp talons locked into the dying twist and scale of fish, its long bones trailing like a ghost behind fins through the dark, cold water. It was beautiful, that water, like a silver coin stretched thin enough to feed us all, smooth as skin before anyone knew the undertow's rough hands lived inside it working everything down to its absence. And water is never lonely. It holds so many. It says, come close, you who want to swallow me. Already I am part of you. Come near, I will shape myself around you. So soft, so calm, I will carry you down to a world you never knew or dreamed. I will gather you into the hands of something stronger, older, deeper. Someone once told me that <clears throat> if you've heard this story before, just ignore it. <laughs> that they they liked the fact that I'd never um, been a stereotypical writer and written about buffalo. So I had to write a poem about a buffalo. <laughs> about buffalo. I live near a buffalo herd. And I like to watch them during the uh, time that they're having babies and watch the, you know, the red placenta waving and think about here the, you know, buffalo are returning. Even if they are close to the freeway. <clears throat> but they are returning, and it's called Return Buffalo. And it contains the whole history of Buffalo. One man made a ladder of stacked up yellow bones to climb the dead toward his own salvation. He wanted light and fire, wanted to reach and be close to his God. But his God was the one who opened his shirt and revealed the scar of mortal climbing. It is the scar that lives in the house with me. It goes to work with me. It is the people I have loved who fell into the straight, unhealed line of history. It is a brother who heard the bellowing cry of sacred hills when nothing there but shadows and rocks. 
It was what ghost dancers heard in their dream of bringing buffalo down from the sky, as if song and prayer were paths life would follow back to land. And the old women, they say, would walk through that land, pick through bones for hide, marrow, anything that could be used or eaten. Once they heard a terrible moan and stood back, and one was not dead, or it had come back from there, walked out of the dark mountains of rotted flesh and bone with her, like a prophet coming out of the hills with a vision too unholy to tell. It must have traveled the endless journey of fear, returned from the far reaches where men believed the world was flat and they would fall over its sharp edge in the pitiless fire. And they must have thought how life came together was a casual matter, war a righteous sin, and betrayal wasn't a round naked thing that would come back to them one day. called Deer Dance, and I was fortunate enough to be in um, Arizona during the Deer Dance one April, and um, I guess I, I could say that I was um, I don't know the, that I have the right word, in awe, mesmerized, amazed at, at the deer dance and the complexity of it and the way that the deer dancer really truly became the deer. And where I live, I, I don't live, I live in the country and so there are deer all over the place and they, sometimes they sleep like outside the house because it's not very well insulated and heat comes out. In fact, I still have pansies blooming in the middle of winter because so much heat comes out of the house. <laughs> so this started out um, with the deer outside my house and then it, it goes back into the deer dance in Arizona and I'll talk a little bit about the deer dance when I finished reading it. This morning when the chill that rises up from the ground is warmed, the snow is melted where the small deer slept. See how their bodies leave their mark? The snow reveals the paths on the hillsides, the white overcrossing pathways into the upper meadows where water comes forth and streams begin. With the new snow, the unseen becomes seen rivers begin this way. At the deer dance last year, after the clashing forces of human good and evil, the men dressed in black, the human women mourning for what was gone, the evergreen sprigs carried in a circle to show the return of spring. That night, after everything human was resolved, a young man, the chosen, became the deer in the white skin of its ancestors, wearing the head of the deer above the human head. With flowers in his antlers, he danced, beautiful and tireless, until he was more than human, until he too was deer. Of all those who were transformed into animals, the travelers Circe turned into pigs, the woman who became the bear, the girl who always remained the child of wolves, none of them wanted to go back to being human. And I would do it too, leave off being human and become what it was that slept outside my door last night, rested in my sleep, 
One evening I hid in the, in the brush south of here and watched at the place where they shed their antlers and where the deer danced, it was true. As my old grandmother said, water came up from the ground and I could hear them breathing at the crooked river. The road there I know, I live here, and always when I walk it, they are not quite sure of me. Looking back now and then to see that I am still far enough away, their gray-brown bodies, the scars of fences, the fur never quite straight, as if they just stepped into it. In ceremonies, balance and harmony are the valued states of being. In most of these old ceremonies, even those like um, the deer dance and some of the, the corn dances that have incorporated Catholicism into them, um, they, they still depend on a long-standing body of knowledge about the natural world and um, they still depend on this sense of harmony, wholeness, and balance. And um, one of the things that the deer dance, there, if you look in a library for books, you'll find numerous books with thousands of songs that go with the ceremony. And different singers will have different songs, but they all come from the same place. And the whole ceremony started when a little deer walked out of the forest.